Every holiday season, it's the same thing. My kids want the latest Instaphone, the cool new Playbox with Kung Fu grip, and a dozen other things I could barely pronounce or f***ing afford. It's enough to make you crazy. Well, not anymore. Why spend a fortune on consumer electronics when you could subscribe to Grover.com and get the latest gear and gadgets for a fraction of the price? Grover is a subscription service that allows you to rent consumer electronics flexibly for a low monthly price. Grover offers phones, drones, laptops, gaming equipment, cameras, and more. And the best part is, Grover has your back covering up to 90% of the repair and damage costs of the device. It's like Netflix or Spotify, but for electronics and subscribing is really f***ing easy. So go to grover.com slash culpa. First, browse and search for the tech you want. Second, select how many months you'd like to rent. And finally, Grover offers one, three, six, or 12 month subscription plans. Place an order and make your first monthly payment. It's just that f***ing easy. You like Apple, folks? Well, how do you like these apples? Grover's prices are f***ing insane. iPhones starting at $44, MacBooks for under 50, a Nintendo for less than $15 a month, or AirPods for $12.90, smart speakers for $7, so you can listen to my show in every room of your house. With Grover, you can subscribe to hundreds of products from your favorite brands like Apple, Samsung, Bose, Dell, Razer, Garmin, and many others by visiting grover.com slash mea culpa. Grover's circular model contributes to the reduction of e-waste by reusing their electronics across multiple life cycles. And there's a big f- deal, folks, so don't be a f- schmuck. Only a Trump would pay full price for consumer electronics when all you need to do is subscribe and save serious money. So sign up for Grover right now and get 10% off each month you rent on any item in the store. That's 10% off when you use promo code MEACULPA at checkout. That's Grover.com slash MEACULPA. Grover.com slash MEACULPA. Go there now. This is Michael Cohen, and you're listening to the best of Mea Culpa. I hope you are enjoying a well-deserved break from the chaos of this past year and have some downtime over the holidays. While you're sitting on the beach or working in your garage, take some time to catch up on old episodes of Mea Culpa. You'll be amazed at how much has stayed exactly the same. And thanks for listening, and we'll see you back here with all new episodes starting on January 6th. Yeah, it's January 6th. Can you believe it? So without further ado, please enjoy this encore presentation of our April 22nd, 2021 interview with the New Yorker's Jane Mayer. This is Michael Cohen, and you're listening to the Mea Culpa Week in Review. There was a collective sigh of relief Tuesday as the Derek Chauvin verdict came in guilty on all charges. Members of the jury, I understand you have a verdict. So there you have it. Less than 10 minutes uh, guilty on all three counts. Guilty second-degree murder, guilty third-degree murder, guilty second-degree manslaughter. You saw the former police officer there, Derek Chauvin, handcuffed. He's going back into jail. He was out of jail on bail awaiting these verdicts. Guilty on all three counts. While the evidence was overwhelming and horrific, the videotape of Chauvin with his knee pressed against the neck of George Floyd was played and replayed in the courtroom to audible sobs and gasps from those in the jury. Okay, thank you. Okay, breathe. Wow. Stop moving. Mama. 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 One of the front couches. Mama. On my right side back. Mama. Mama. While Chauvin's defense attorney attempted to blame the presence of drugs in Floyd's system as the cause of death, the jurors heard overwhelming testimony to the guilt of Derek Chauvin. That said, the country has been here before, and the verdict usually lets these perpetrators off the hook. 
Many of us still bear the trauma of Rodney King when an all-white jury let the officers who brutally beat him go. It's the match that lit the fuse that led to the 1992 L.A. riots. And they struck me across the face real hard with a billy club after I was laying face down with my hands tied. I was scared. I was scared. I was scared for my life. We, the jury, in the above entitled action, find the defendant, Lawrence M. Powell, not guilty of the crime of assault by force likely to produce great bodily injury and with a deadly weapon. The jury in the Los Angeles police brutality trial has just reached its verdicts. The four police officers who were videotaped repeatedly beating an unarmed man were found not guilty on all but one and count. Not one of the four police officers seen on videotape beating Mr. King a year ago is guilty of using excessive force. They've all been found not guilty on all but one count. And the jurors were unable to reach it. Charges have been declared on this trial on one count against Powell. That was a charge of assault and charge. The jurors were unable to reach it. 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 The jurors were unable to reach it whites, one Asian, and one Hispanic. Commentators noted that in Minnesota, only one police officer ever has been convicted of killing a civilian, and that was a black officer who shot a white woman. So, understandably, the community was on edge, left to wonder if justice would be served and Chauvin held accountable for extinguishing another man's life, or would he be yet another symbol of the miscarriage of justice? The jury, after only 11 hours of deliberation, delivered their verdict, which is usually a good sign for the prosecution. I would not call today's verdict justice, however, because justice implies true restoration. But it is accountability, which is the first step towards justice. And now the cause of justice is in your hands. And when I say your hands, I mean the hands of the people of the United States. George Floyd mattered. He was loved by his family and his friends. His death shocked the conscience of our community, our com country, the whole world. He was loved by his family and friends. But that isn't why he mattered. He mattered because he was a human being. And then the verdict itself was read. And good riddance to Derek Chauvin. I want to be clear that I am not anti-police. I'm actually pro-police. I'm just against bad cops who beat and kill innocent civilians. Ask any cop what the Derek Chauvins of the world do to officers' morale. It's devastating. Today, Lieutenant Richard Zimmerman, the longest-serving officer in the Minneapolis Police Department, delivered a scathing rebuke of former officer Derek Chauvin's use of force on George Floyd. Totally unnecessary. What do you mean? Um, well, first of all, pulling him down to the ground, face down, and putting your knee on the neck for that amount of time is just uncalled for. I saw no reason why the officers felt they were in danger. The moment a cop steps over the line, he makes every other cop's job a thousand times harder. Still, there are significant systemic issues that must be addressed. According to the New York Times, since testimony began on March 29, at least 64 people have died at the hands of law enforcement nationwide, with black and Latino people representing more than half of the dead. As of Saturday, the average was more than three killings a day. Just miles from where George Floyd died, a police officer shot and killed a young unarmed black man, reigniting outrage and inflaming tensions. Minneapolis, of course, was already on edge as the nation watches the murder trial of Derek Chauvin. The police chief in Brooklyn Center, that's the suburb outside the city, says cops pulled over 20-year-old Dante Wright for expired tags and tried to arrest him for an outstanding warrant. There was a struggle. The police chief says one of the officers pulled out her gun by mistake, thinking it was her taser, and fired. Today, the police chief released body cam video of the shooting. President Biden called the guilty verdict a potential giant step forward in the march toward justice in America. But he also called the jury's decision a much too rare step for black Americans who have been killed or abused during interactions with the police. So we can't leave this moment or look away thinking our work is done. 
We have to look at it. We have to we have to look as, as we did for those nine minutes and 29 seconds. We have to listen. I can't breathe. I can't breathe. Those are George Floyd's last words. We can't let those words die with him. We have to keep hearing those words. We must not turn away. We can't turn away. We have a chance to begin to change the trajectory in this country. In the midst of what seems like a nonstop wave of police violence, President Biden has repeatedly called on Congress to pass an ambitious policing overhaul bill named after George Floyd. On Tuesday evening, both he and Vice President Kamala Harris, who as a senator helped to write the bill, called on lawmakers to do more. America has a long history of systemic racism. Black Americans and black men in particular have been treated throughout the course of our history as less than human. Black men are fathers and brothers and sons and uncles and grandfathers and friends and neighbors. Their lives must be valued in our education system, in our health care system, in our housing system, in our economic system, in our criminal justice system, in our nation. Full stop. Passed by House Democrats in March, the bill would address policies that are at the center of the debate over race and policing. It would ban chokeholds and eliminate existing protections under qualified immunity, which shields officials who had been accused of violating others' constitutional rights. It would also create a national registry to track police officers who have engaged in misconduct. President Biden can trace his political success in part to how he responded to the nationwide protests that rose up after George Floyd's death. We do every day to change hearts and minds as well as laws and policies. That's the work we have to do. Only then will full justice and full equality be delivered to all Americans. And that's what I just discussed with the Floyd family. The guilty verdict does not bring back George. But through the family's pain, they're finding purpose. So George's legacy will not be just about his death, but about what we must do in his memory. Last June, as former President Trump stoked tensions on Twitter, calling the protests a result of the radical left and threatening to send in the National Guard, Biden traveled to Houston with his wife, Dr. Jill Biden, to meet with Mr. Floyd's relatives. He became, for many, amidst a national reconciliation on race, a symbol of healing. But that healing remains a distant goal as police killings continue to compound upon themselves. A new body cam video of the police shooting of a 13-year-old in Chicago. Adam Toledo died two and a half weeks ago in what authorities are calling an armed confrontation. And there remains the hurdle of the GOP and MAGA nation who are brainwashed into believing that there exists an Antifa boogeyman ready to burn down the suburbs. Where you basically have justice meted out because the jury is scared uh, of what a mob may do. And again, I'm not saying that's what happened here, but that speaker seemed to suggest that that had an impact. Uh, that's completely uh, antithetical to the rule of law. And I, gotta, I think what we've done with our bill, our any riot bill, is saying uh, you, know, you engage in that. You're going to jail. You're not going to gain uh, by doing that. Uh, we, we're going to maintain law and order. Beyond that is the ugly rhetoric coming from the right and Fox News that, as usual, make it seem like we live in two different countries simultaneously. I'm kind of more worried about the rest of the country, which, thanks to police in action, in case you haven't noticed, is, like, boarded up. <laughs> so- Leading the charge in this initiative 
are GOP state legislators who have taken the MAGA mantle and this time are assaulting the legitimate right to protest. Florida Democratic lawmakers are calling a new anti-riot bill overkill. Governor Ron DeSantis says it would protect Florida from mob revolts. It creates a new offense of mob intimidation and enhances penalties for defacing public monuments, while also making the posting of private information about people on social media sites with intent to threaten or intimidate or incite violence a crime. Democratic Senator Thurston Perry says the bill is overkill and designed to silence free speech and peaceful assemblies, primarily by people of color. The measures are part of a wave of new anti-protest legislation sponsored and supported by Republicans in the 11 months since Black Lives Matter protests swept the country following the death of George Floyd and highlights the stark division in GOP and Democratic responses to the killing of Mr. Floyd. As with everything these days, since the summer, positions have hardened and reflect the Trump assertion that Black Lives Matter are a dangerous radical group bent on destroying this country. Our nation has been gripped by professional anarchists, violent mobs, arsonists, looters, criminals, rioters, Antifa, and others. A number of state and local governments have failed to take necessary action to safeguard their residents. Innocent people have been savagely beaten. Highlighting the right word, nativist drift of the GOP, former President Bush went on the Today Show Tuesday to express his own dismay with the magnified GOP and Trump era. Uh, I would describe it as isolationist, protectionist, and to a certain extent, nativist. That this happened at all is a remarkable turn of events, illustrative of where the 2021 GOP finds itself. In an interview with the New York Times former chief of staff, Andrew Card, speaking for the president, said that January 6th was something of a breaking point for him. Kind of made me sick. It did make me sick. These are certainly interesting times when we pine for the return of George W. Bush, or at least the GOP of his era. The party has hardened itself with an agenda that is Trumpist to the core and uses his lies and belligerence to pass legislation that is dangerous, regressive, and racist to the core. The only way for this to stop is for Trump to go to prison. He is a dangerous criminal and his presence undermines the very fabric of democracy. And now for the main event. It's been a few weeks since we checked in on the action downtown with the Manhattan DA's office. But no matter the time of day, Cy Vance and his tough-as-nails prosecutor, Mark Pomerantz, are working 24-7 to bring down Donald Trump. I can vouch for their work as I've been down there eight separate times. And I guarantee you that the wheels of justice are turning. Now, it may be turning slow and methodical, but that's the point. Not to bring just any charge, but to bring a charge that sticks with Trump going down for the count. Helping me look into the sprawling operation led by Cy Vance is my next guest, the New Yorker's own Jay Mayer. A staff writer for the legendary magazine for 26 years, Mayer is the chief Washington correspondent covering politics, culture, and national security. Mayer is the author of the 2016 Times bestseller, Dark Money, the hidden history of the billionaires behind the rise of the radical right, which the Times named as one of the 10 best books of the year, and which began as a 2010 New Yorker piece about the Koch brothers' deep influence on American politics. She also wrote the 2008 New York Times bestseller, The Dark Side, the inside story of how the war on terror turned into a war on American ideals a finalist for the National Book Award, which was based on her New Yorker articles as well. Mayer's recent work for The New Yorker includes a fantastic profile of Manhattan DA Cy Vance Jr. that looks at the mechanism he has created to bring down the former president. My conversation today with Mayer includes these topics as far more as she opens her vast knowledge and impeccable sourcing to mea culpa. So let's listen now to that conversation. In a March 29th piece for The New Yorker, you published the details of a troubling conference call between a lobbyist for the Koch brothers and a group of congressional aides, including an advisor to Senate Minority Leader Mitch McConnell, 
about how to derail the enormously popular election reform bills that the House of Representatives have sent over to the Senate. Now, you wrote the following, and I quote, The speakers on the call expressed alarm at the broad popularity of the bill's provision calling for more public disclosure about secret political donors. The participants conceded that the bill, which would stem the flow of dark money from such political donors as the billionaire oil magnate Charles Koch, was so popular that it wasn't worth trying to mount a public advocacy campaign to shift opinion. Now, instead, a senior Koch operative said that opponents would be better off ignoring the will of American voters and trying to kill the bill in Congress. If you would, discuss with me how this is currently playing out and what were some of the dirtier tactics employed to try to make this bill disappear? Well, it's absolutely right. This was a a private meeting that a a recording of which I got a hold of. So you can hear what these people really say behind closed doors. And what they're saying is the American people don't want billionaires buying elections. And this legislation might stop billionaires from buying elections. And they want to kill the legislation. They want to keep things the way they are. They want to keep the power they've got and keep the money they've got. So what are they talking about doing? They're saying we're going to have to kill it in the back rooms. What they the the phrase they use is they say we're going to have to kill it under the dome in in Congress, meaning under the congressional dome. And what they're going to do first, they're going to try to put pressure on the one Democrat who may be a holdout. That's Joe Manchin, the senator from West Virginia. And if they lose him and he supports the bill along with the rest of the Democrats all of the rest of whom are supporting the bill and co-sponsoring it. If the Democrats go for it, along with Manchin, what the Republicans are going to do is filibuster it. They're going to use these sort of arcane Senate rules to kill it somehow with a filibuster that requires an extra 10 votes, which would mean 10 Republican votes. The Republicans are just going to completely stiff the bill. So that's what they'll try to do in order to keep the money flowing, the dark money flowing, the big donors in charge. It's interesting. I mean, you know, it's 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 a it's a real effort. This is one of the most serious efforts to fight corruption that we've seen in a half century in Washington. And the Republicans at this point, or at least Mitch McConnell, is trying to keep keep things as just as corrupt as they've ever been. But Republicans in in general, the real Republicans out there, the voters, they want to clean things up. It's just the guys who are holding office who are doing this. Well, what I don't understand is why would Republicans not want this? Because it's interesting every single time that there's a large Democrat donor, the Republicans start crying foul. They say, that's not fair. He can't do that. I can't tell you how many times I've seen that over the course of you know my, my time with Trump and with the Trump campaign. They used to scream bloody murder that the Democrats have all the Silicon Valley. They have all the new big tech money. And if you really wanted to get rid of this, if you really wanted to do the right thing, why would somebody like Mitch McConnell or any of the Republicans not go along with this? It sounds like the right idea to me. I mean, there's to me, I never understood why you have campaigns for the presidency to the tune of over a billion dollars spent. That's so much freaking money. It's so much money. I don't understand why you need to spend a billion dollars in today's age where everything is virtual. It's all online. Why do we need a billion dollars? You don't. I mean, the truth is that what this bill would do is it has public financing. It has matching money for small donors so they can have much more equality with the big donors. It, it's there are a million things you could do to make it more fair and to even, as you say, get the money out of politics. But the people who've won the elections right now are the ones who who know how to use this system. And that is and nobody, nobody knows about how to raise money and use it politically than Mitch McConnell. This is a system that he helped build, and he's holding on tight to it. You know, it's interesting. Your old boss, Trump, was actually very smart about this during the 2016 campaign. He ran against corruption. 
he and Bernie Sanders had some of the same lines. They both went after the Kochs, actually, the Koch brothers, who were the big money guys on the Republican side. He saw where the public was on this, which is they want to get rid of corruption. But of course, he didn't get rid of corruption. It may have just been a selling line for him. But at least he saw that that's what the public wanted. Right. Well, don't forget, Trump also said that he was not taking any any money from anybody. I'm very rich. Uh, guys, I'm really, really rich, <laughs> right? I'm going to spend my own money. I'm gonna spend the fit. As soon as that money hit the bank account, right, uh, for the campaign, he was already sucking it out. He wanted the money back that he had put in, you know, and then, and then some. But what's interesting is while he attacked the Koch brothers on a regular basis for their involvement or, as he would call it, interference in the political system, I was at a multitude of fundraisers, one in particular, which was a big dollar, a big dollar donor here in Manhattan at a very prominent individual individual's apartment. Uh, one of the Koch brothers was there. So I just find it very interesting. Look, we don't we all acknowledge David Koch, you know, after making a lot of noise about this and pretending they didn't like or saying they didn't like Trump. David Koch was there on election night with with Trump. He was in the, you know, the back room with the big, big rollers. So they got on board fast because they could see where the power was going. And of course, your Trump, Trump got a lot of help from Robert Mercer and his daughter, Rebecca Mercer, gigantic uh, finance people who put a uh, put their heft behind Trump to help him win. While he was busy talking about small donors, he was hanging out with big donors. Yeah. And the big donors really Pay, they really ponied up very, very, very quickly into a lot of money because they realized that you're dealing with somebody who's ignorant and arrogant. And what you need to do is if you could placate him, right, stroke the little boy's quaff, right? Or in his case, his can, you know, his, um, <laughs> his quaff is right. If you stroke him, right, all of a sudden what happens? Now he's talking good about you. He's taking your phone calls. And they all realized that he's, as they... You know, Malcolm Nance used to call him. He's a useful idiot. And that's what that's what Donald Trump was to them, a useful idiot that they knew that they could play for their own personal benefit, for their own financial gain. Well, I know you you probably don't want to talk only about this, but I got to say he was so useful to the Koch brothers that his administration did so many favors for the big oil companies. And and they are they are in the oil business themselves. And I mean, and the kinds of environmental policies he had where he got rid of all the regulations and he dropped the taxes, corporate taxes hugely. Um, This was this was their dream come true. So they may have made a fuss about him getting elected in the beginning, but then he really served their interests. I do want to tell you, though, the fact that he dropped all of the regulations for the Environmental Protection Agency and for other things that he did was not from the Koch brothers. This was actually something that he would talk about on a regular basis. Like, for example, at his Trump National Golf Club in Potomac, which is there in Washington, D.C., what he did is he ripped down all of the trees against the which is a violation by the EPA. You were not supposed to do that. But they made the allegation that the trees fell down as a result of a hurricane that had gone through the Virginia area, which it did not. But he had them start knocking the trees down. Why? Because he wanted an open view of the river. Right from the golf course and makes the property more valuable. It makes the experience as a golfer more pleasant. Instead of looking at trees, you're looking at the water. So things like that always bothered him that it's my property. I can do whatever I want. I should be allowed to do whatever I want. And let's get rid of all the regulation because all the regulation does is it slows down business And that's why business was moving, for example, in manufacturing to China, because they don't have the same EPA mandates that we have here in the United States. They also have so much pollution in Beijing that you can't breathe the air. Do you think Donald Trump cares about pollution? Donald Trump doesn't care about anything. Can I ask you a question, which is on this on the subject? I always wondered, where did he get this cockeyed view that climate change is a hoax. And, you know, even his own daughter supposedly understood that that climate change is for real, Ivanka. 
So where did he come up with this idea that climate change is a hoax, hoax and that wind turbines cause cancer? All these 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 really ignorant okay, ideas. So let me so let me tell you, they are ignorant, and it's something I describe Donald as on a regular basis. He happens to be ignorant. Had he picked up a book or read a single manifest on the windmills, he would understand that they don't kill birds. Now, do some birds die? Sure they do, right? Um, but not to the extent that he constantly refers to it. The reason he hates windmills is because they were contemplating, and they did, put windmills in the water right outside of his Scotland property, right outside the Trump National Golf Club in Aberdeen, Scotland. And he hates the way they look. For him, it's all aesthetics. It's not about the environment. It's not about the future. He doesn't care about this planet. His feeling is once he's dead, he doesn't care if the planet implodes tomorrow, as long as he's not there. And as far as Ivanka is concerned, Ivanka has no opinions on anything. Her opinions are predicated upon what she thinks is the popularist view for her. She's no different than her father. Her father does the same thing. It's all about a popularist view. But she's trying to attract a different audience than her father. Right. You know, she doesn't want the same sort of white supremacist, proud boy, oath keeper. That's not who she's looking for. She's looking for the millennials so that she could grift off them and try to become like another Kim Kardashian. All right. And sell her her dresses or her knockoff shoes or whatever else that she's pawning off. But that's neither here. But you know something? One other thing, Jane, that always that always fascinates me is the fact that you have. So many people who end up with recordings. Now, I know when I recorded Trump that one time, I only recorded him that one time, and there was a reason why I did it. But I find it interesting, like when Trump allowed Woodward to come in to the office and to tape the conversation. You know that there's a conversation going on. You know it's being taped. And he's so reckless in the things that he says Right. He expresses to Woodward that he knew that the coronavirus was deadly, but he didn't want people to panic because he's a good guy. I don't want people to panic. Right. (sighs) Right. It's it's so ridiculous. And it's just not true. What he didn't want is he didn't want the economy to get damaged by the pandemic. And he was willing to trade American lives for a reelection even though it worked to the opposite, right, where he lost the election, most, mostly because of his bungling of the pandemic. But the question I wanted to ask you is when people know that they're in an audience and they're being recorded, they say the stupidest things. And that's how, like, you got the recording of the, with the Koch brothers, right? It's amazing to me that people like that wouldn't confiscate cell phones Right. And put them away. There's no recording devices allowed. It reminds me of like the skiff when I went there to testify before Congress. They bring you into the skiff. There's no cell phones allowed inside. They don't want it recorded. Well, I have to say, as a reporter, I I go on the basic premise that anything I ever say, it could be public. I think you just got to assume these days that there that someone may be recording somewhere and it, and it could all go public. And, you know, I guess Trump must feel like he can just get away with saying whatever he wants to say. And it doesn't really matter. Right. Because he has gotten away with everything so far. That's the point I was going to make. He has his whole life. He's had stupid people like me protecting him, you know, day in and day out, day in and day out from all of the all of the craziness, madness, and stupidity that he put out there. As the occurrence of identity scams continue to increase, more people are looking for ways to protect themselves from cyber criminals. In fact, 60% of Americans believe it is likely that identity theft will cause them a financial loss in the next year. You put your information in so many places online. Unfortunately, cyber criminals around the world keep finding new ways to steal identities. The all-in-one protection of Norton 360 with LifeLock makes it easy to have protection in the digital world. Device security blocks cyber criminals from stealing personal information on your devices. VPN with bank-grade encryption helps keep the personal information you send over Wi-Fi safe. 
LifeLock Identity Theft Protection monitors your personal information and alerts you to potential threats to your identity. Now, no one can prevent all cybercrime and identity theft or monitor all transactions at all businesses. But if you have Norton 360 with LifeLock, you can opt into cyber safety. So sign up today and save 25% or more off your first year by going to Norton.com slash Cohen. That's 25% off at Norton.com slash Cohen. Moving forward, I wanted to ask you, last month in The New Yorker, you published a widely discussed look into Manhattan District Attorney Cy Vance's case against Donald Trump and posited that it was in many ways a stress test of the criminal justice system on whether or not Trump is actually above the law. Discuss this with me and my listeners. Yeah, well, so again, this just segues right in from what you're just saying. Trump has gotten away with everything all his life. I mean, he's supposedly been through over 4,000 lawsuits. He's been accused by at least 26 women we know of of sexual misconduct. Uh, He's gone through a half dozen bankruptcies and lived to tell the tale and and be elected president of the United States. So uh, there are all kinds of allegations about the possible legal infractions that he's committed over his career. And the question is whether it will ever catch up with him. He, He famously said that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and it wouldn't stop him, wouldn't hurt him. And his lawyer said that that's true. While he was president, he couldn't be charged with shooting someone, even if he did it on Fifth Avenue. This draws into question sort of the fundamental idea of American democracy, which is nobody's above the law. Not even the president is above the law. And that's what this test case is going to show, whether that's true or not. You know, it's that was sort of the battle cry of the Democrats for so many months before the actual election, when they were bringing Trump up on the first impeachment and then again on the second, they tried to hammer the same way that Trump does over and over and over again, the fact that no one is above the law. I believe every single Democrat actually used that line. But yet, is he above the law? Because you're right, he has managed to somehow get away with everything on a regular basis, with very little consequence so far. One of the biggest problems that I see with that is the members of Congress really have an obligation to go back, now that he's not president, now that he doesn't have Bill Barr standing behind him with a memo that says that you cannot indict a sitting president. There are so many things that Donald Trump did from obstruction of justice to witness tampering to to lying. I mean, Just for example, in the documents that he had to provide to Congress that I testified upon, if you take a look at his documents, his interrogatories, the responses um, to the interrogatories that were posed to him by um, the Congress that went to his counsel, his responses do not comport with my statements or so many of of the other individuals that actually testified truthfully and honestly. Well, what about a 1,000 violation to Donald Trump for lying to Congress? Why is he not held responsible for the things that I was held responsible for? I mean, again, my big lie was done at the direction of and for the benefit of Donald Trump. And the big lie was the number of times that I spoke to Donald about the failed real estate project in Moscow. I stated to Congress it was three times when in actuality it was 10. That's the big lie. Well, what about Donald Trump lying on probably every single response to their interrogatories? Why are they not now holding him responsible? Oh, because now it would seem political? Well, yeah, yeah, it should seem political because it is political. He completely destroyed the Mueller report. He completely attacked the Democratic members of Congress, I would hold him responsible for lying to Congress, for obstruction of justice, for witness tampering, and the multitude of other crimes that are so blatant. They're so out there. They're like low-hanging fruit. I don't know how and why he just gets away with it all the time. Well, you're not alone in in saying so. And in the story that I did, I talked to Andrew Weissman, and he is one of the people who's, you know, a, a former famous prosecutor who said that he, and he worked with the Mueller Commission, 
and he said that he really thinks that Trump should be brought up on charges of obstruction of justice coming out of that. But he also acknowledged that he thinks it's not likely to happen. I mean, part of the problem, you know, you understand the problem as well as anybody. The problem is that that Trump used the Department of Justice as his own personal law firm, or he tried to, to make them an extension of his own power and and use them to go after his enemies. And so Merrick Garland, the, the attorney general now, is trying very hard to restore the Department of Justice to a sort of an independent integrity that doesn't make it into a political tool. So he's kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. He could go after Trump, but it would look a little bit like, you know, potentially like he's like it's the new president going after the old president simply for political reasons. And it might not further the interest of showing that the Justice Department is supposed to be above politics. And that's the problem there. But so this is why Vance, in a lot of ways, is the one piece of sort of legal infrastructure that really could hold Trump accountable at this point. I don't I don't I don't expect, though it's possible, the Department of Justice would still go after Trump. I mean, it's not it's not impossible that they would even go after Trump for the case that you were involved with, the, the you know, the Stormy Daniels payments. Wait, I mean, whoa, that, whoa, whoa, whoa. Hold on, Jane. Hold on. Yeah. Maybe you're right. They won't go after the Stormy Daniels one. Why are they not going after Trump and Bill Barr for violating my First Amendment constitutional right, having me remanded back to prison because I refused to sign a document that would have prevented me from publishing a book that was actually already with the printers. Why would they not then go after the president and the form, the former president, and the former attorney general for violating another citizen's constitutional rights? I mean, to me, it's low hanging fruit. My answer is, I, I don't, you know, I just think the answer is, you, as you know, is political. Um, and, and, and we'll see what, what it's a, it's a worthy question. We'll see what Merrick Garland does. I think reporters need to keep asking, just like you're asking. But my guess from having covered Washington is that there's not a big appetite there. At least I haven't seen it. And that, in fact, there is a big appetite in New York, where I do think Cyrus Vance, the um, Manhattan district attorney, is damn serious about going after Trump. Yes, he is. And which is Well, that's true. And let's do that. Let's use that as a segue. If you can, tell my listeners about Cy Vance as a person. Like, what's his background? Where does he stand politically? And does he have an ambition beyond the Manhattan District Attorney's Office? We all know that he's leaving in December. What's he going to do after? Tell us what you know. You know, I think after he's not going to do something like political or run for a big office or anything like that. I think so if if he you know, he may be following some of his interests in the legal world, but nothing that's going to make a huge splash, I don't think, from from what I've been able to get. So what so when you know that what you see is that this case in a way is his legacy. What he's talking about, what he's looking at is this is going to be the capstone of his own reputation and career. And so it matters to him in that way. I, you know, and I think if people, he's had a lot of criticism during his career as being Manhattan DA, there's a nickname that the tabloids had for him, which was, they called him soft sigh um, because the critics say he left, uh, he let Ivanka Trump and Don Jr. off the hook earlier in an earlier case People think that he went too soft on Harvey Weinstein the first time around by not bringing charge against him the first time. And he also made a lot of noise about getting ready to prosecute Dominique Strauss-Kahn, who was the director of the International Monetary Fund, who, you know, was was involved in a, a what what seemed to be um, looked like a rape in a hotel in New York, a huge financier from France who was running for president. And then he changed his mind and didn't didn't press charges. So people so he was in kind of hot water in New York for maybe being too soft on on powerful people. Yeah, I mean, I remember obviously I was involved in that Trump Soho matter, which was where the allegation was that Don and Ivanka had put statements out there to the public which were inaccurate. 
It's amazing how the father came right to the defense, not because it was his kids, but rather because it was his project. And so his argument was that this is all about puffing and everybody in real estate puffs. And so how could you then go ahead? He goes, not only is everybody in real estate, every single article has some sort of puffing in it where they expand on how many units have been sold or how much money they're worth or whatever it was. And what was amazing is every time Trump would scour the newspaper, he would pull out articles. He would cut it out with his big giant gold scissors and he would highlight or underline in black some puffing that he thought was, you know, on line with what Don and Ivanka had done. And then he would make photocopies and send it to myself, to Alan, to George, to the other Alan, to this one, to that one, right? Because he was proving to us that puffing is allowed. I mean, the, the man is truly amazing on so many different levels. But I've met Cy Vance, and I can tell you, I don't find him to be soft. You know, we can all turn around and take some aspect of our work career and say we probably could have or should have done something, you know, different in this respect. Uh, and I'm sure going back, hindsight being 2020, so I probably would have liked to have done things a couple, uh, you know, a little different than the way that he did. But, you know, I think he's been um, relatively considered a good DA, you know, here in New York. Which brings me to my next question to you, Jane. In that article on Cy Vance, you also described how all the records for the Trump case are being kept on a special disc in this amazing room in the Louis Lefkowitz State Office building down in Lower Manhattan called the Radio Frequency Isolation Chamber. I love the names that they come up with, right? It's almost like science fiction level protection for digital records. Can you describe this special room for my listeners and what happens in there? Yeah, I mean, it's like Tutankhamen's tomb. The walls are covered in this kind of glimmering copper foil, and it's behind these bank vault kind of huge metal doors. And all of this is meant to keep the digital records from being tampered with so that like nobody can hack from outside. They're really, they're, they're guarding Trump's tax records as if they were the crown jewels. And in a way they are, because they may be, you know, something that changes history here. Yeah, I just want to say another thing or two about Cy Vance. I was just going to say, yes, he's got this reputation to some extent in the eyes of his critics for being soft. But what he is, from my standpoint, from looking closely at him, is he is the exact opposite of Donald Trump culturally. This is a man who is the offspring of kind of patrician upstanding public servants who really believes that the law rules and that everybody has to have a fair trial and that you don't bend the rules for anybody. He's, um, he, he's a boy scout and, and he comes out of a kind of a, of, of an ethic that is, is, is kind of the world that Trump in some ways wanted to top topple when he came out of Queens um, Cy Vance was born into sort of the top drawer of New York society in a certain way. Um, but he's not just, you know, he do, he's not out there just to make money. He's out there to do good in the world. And this must sort of drive Trump crazy. So you've got a real clash of cultures in these two. So it's going to make, I think it's going to make, if there are charges brought, any trial is going to be a fascinating clash of of two very different kinds of New Yorkers and two very different kinds of people in public life. You know, it doesn't drive Trump crazy that he doesn't want to make money, that he wants to do good. It doesn't drive him crazy. He doesn't understand it at all. He cannot understand that somebody would actually want to do good, that that's their belief system, because as you, as you appropriately stated, it's so contrary to his position on everything. You know, if one person that's around him makes money, it bothers him that he's not in on the take because he believes that he's the Don and that everybody should basically come, you know, like in the movie Goodfellas, they should come and they should put an envelope into his hand to pay him for some, in some regard, for something that he did, which is how they made the money. And it really bothered him. It bothered him when his friends made money. It bothered him when a lot of the guys 
who were working for him made money. That's why Brad Pascal ultimately got fired because Trump found out that he bought himself a Ferrari. Trump doesn't like when anybody else makes money. It's truly, it's, he really is a very interesting case study in narcissism and sociopathy. I mean, that's just, that's why I've written it in my book, Disloyal, all over the place. He is a narcissistic sociopath that has so many character flaws. And I, I don't understand why or how I ended up staying around that so long. I saw it, but why I dismissed it, why I moved forward, I don't have that answer. One day I'll figure it out. It wasn't the money. People, the first thing that these haters on Twitter, you know, like to come after me for, oh, you know, you were just grifting off of him. I wasn't grifting off of Trump. I can assure you on that one. I retired when I was 39 years old. I got very lucky early on. And as a result of this crap, I lost it all. So, but rest assured, this is no Michael Cohen rags to riches story. Thanks to Donald Trump, this is a this is a riches to rags story. And um, well, what you know, is the hope? I will what? I will tell you I will tell you one thing that one of the things people always ask me is why I continue to work with the Manhattan DA and other law enforcement and congressional committees when not one of them have done a single thing for me. And the answer is because I've asked them to do nothing for me, including the Southern District of New York, who I have no regard for at all. You want to talk about a corrupt office? Look at the SDNY. So for me, I'm doing it because this is my way of making amends for what I unleashed, being the Dr. Frankenstein and releasing this monster on all of us. That's why I do it. I have a question for you, which is about what is this hold that Trump has on the people around him? I'm curious because it sounds like Alan Weisselberg is also very much um, in his thrall. At least if you listen to Alan Weisselberg's former daughter-in-law, Jennifer Weisselberg, she says that her former father-in-law, Alan Weisselberg, the chief financial officer in the Trump company, Trump organization, would do anything for Trump's approval. How does he make people feel like they'll do anything for him? What 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 is it? I'm just curious. Is it some kind of crazy charisma he has? Well, he does have charisma. There's no doubt about that. He managed to bamboozle 74 million Americans to vote for him in this 2020 election. But what I will turn around and tell you is I I could not be more diametrically different than Alan Weisselberg in why I stayed with Trump and why Allen stayed. Allen was a cab driver going way, way back that saw a, an article, uh, an advertisement by Fred Trump for looking for a bookkeeper. And he applied for it. And Allen has smarts. There's no doubt about that. Um, he's, he's good with numbers. He ended up as a bookkeeper for Fred Trump. When Fred started loaning Donald money to come into Manhattan, Fred didn't trust his own son with the money. So he sent Allen with him. Allen has achieved a level in society and in the economic, you know, stratosphere here, right, that he never thought he would be able to achieve. He's not a CPA, right? And yet somewhere along the line, a very mediocre bookkeeper becomes the CFO of the Trump organization. So for him, it's all about the Benjamins, right? Because his son Barry was working for Donald as well, you know, um, at the at the ice rink and you know Lasker and also Woman and then the uh, what do you call it the carousel. So the entire family's finances were predicated upon the productivity of the Trump organization. Whereas for me, I'll tell you the spell. It's the celebrity stardom that he brought. There was always action going on and. Each and every one of us has some flaw in our own personality, in our own character that we're looking for. And somehow or another, he fills it. And that's the only way that I could describe why I refuse to listen to my wife and my children and leave is because it was filling something in my life that I needed. And again, I should have listened. You know, they always say, Listen to your wife, <laughs> you know, listen to your kids. Uh, I probably should have, you know, in speaking of sources for your story, did they ever contemplate what happens to Trump if he's actually convicted? Like, will he be going to Rikers willingly or does he try to flee the country? 
Did you pose those questions? Yeah, I, I did. And I have to say, I, I, nobody who knew Trump, who I interviewed, thinks he would ever go to Rikers. They do not see him in the orange jumpsuit. They see him, you know, the people who've worked with him in the past or his niece, Mary Trump, they all think he'll he'll abscond in some way, leave the country, um, maybe possibly, you know, if he were convicted, get some kind of home confinement sort of situation, but not even likely that. Um, they 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 just don't think that he would sit for it, uh, uh, you know. They, they they he'd wriggle out of it some way around the, you know, basically going abroad is one thing. And he was actually, you know, he was fueling his jet, his private plane on election night in 2016 to go to his golf course in in Scotland, and he was pl- he was planning to to leave town and kind of just get over the loss there. And then to his huge surprise, he won. So he's thought of kind of fleeing the country before when there's bad news. But this is a question where I think I'd love to know what you think. What do you think? He okay, first, so Jane, let me give you the answer. First and foremost, the home confinement aspect will not be because that's what Trump wants. It's probably what would happen because as a former president, We've entrusted an idiot with national security information that's sitting in his head, and you could rest assured that he would sell that information on the drop of a dime. So if they gave him home confinement, it would be very significant and very severe home confinement, you know, where they'd be monitoring his telephones, uh, no internet, no cell phone. I mean, I think that they would really have home confinement like if it was prison. Now, as far as the fact that he's not going to go to Rikers, well, that certainly doesn't help my merchandising for the Mea Culpa podcast, right? Because we did create an orange jumpsuit with the DJT symbol onto it. So, uh, you know, I, I hope that you're wrong on that one Tell because they seem to be doing they seem to be doing <laughs> very, very well. But do I think he would flee the country? The answer is no, right? And I'm going to tell you the reason why. Because there are only a couple of countries that don't have extradition, one of which is Russia. And he would never go to Russia because despite the fact he's a useful idiot for Putin, Putin will use him and discard him. And he knows it because Putin is everything that Donald wants to be. He's tough. He's ruthless. He's incredibly shrewd. And he's incredibly calculating. And it's everything that Donald is not. Donald is a guy that goes off of a gut instinct. And to think that your gut is right all the time is what makes, again, him ignorant and arrogant. But, you know, like Namibia is like one country that doesn't have extradition in West Africa. Rest assured, Donald Trump's not going there. Right. I think another place is Morocco. Right. They don't have extradition. He's not going to live in Morocco either. Well, first of all, how could he? He despises Muslims. Right. And, you know, and all he eats is hamburgers. Right. So, you know, what is he going to do in in a place like like Marrakesh or in Namibia? He's going to be ordering in McDonald's. The answer to that is no. So rest assured, um, I think he's banking more on the fact that it would be very difficult to put a president in prison. Though, let's not forget that they're doing that in France now uh, to Sarkozy, right? They charged him, and I think he's going to be incarcerated for a year. So I guess we'll see what happens with him there. Now, one of the interesting twists you point out in your story is that even if convicted and Trump does go to prison, which I do hope, He may still end up running for president again. Now, apparently, a felony conviction does not bar one from running. Discuss this with me because I don't think that's accurate. Well, we we were shocked. I have to say, um, I thought it would it was that it was one of the qualifications for being president that you had to uh, not have a felony record. My my editor also thought that it would d- bar you from running for president. So we both had the assumption that that would be the end if he were convicted. But our uh, fact checking department at the New Yorker, which is where, you know, that they, they are amazing. They looked it up, they researched it, and they came back and they said, guess what? 
there is it it does not disqualify you to run for president if you have been convicted of a felony. I'm not so sure that that's right. Somewhere along the line, I've always remembered you can run for state office like I could have run for mayor if I wanted or I could even run for governor, but you can't run for federal office. I mean, one of the things until a couple of years ago when Cuomo changed it, felons weren't even allowed to vote. So I find it hard to imagine that in a state where you're not even allowed to vote, that you can still run for the presidency. I I just don't think that that's accurate. But I'll tell you something. I would love. I mean, here we are in a podcast. You probably got a pretty big audience. I I welcome anybody to help, you know, definitively figure this out, because we couldn't find anything that barred someone from running for president with a felony conviction. But, you know, you never say never in this business. So, well, Jane, if that's the case, Jane, if that's the case, Cohen 2024, baby. (laughs) <laughs> right. What am I playing around talking about maybe running for mayor or for governor here? You know what? If Trump could do it and I can make him into a president, I'm pretty sure I'm a much better human being than he is. And guaranteed, Cohen 2024. What do you think? Well, I guess it sounds like in your state you're going to be able to vote for yourself. But that's not true in every state in this country. Well, that's true. So we do have to figure that out to see if um, I'm going to throw my hand, you know, I'm going to throw my neck into the into the uh, guillotine again for a second time. (laughs) Jane, let me ask you this question. In what ways did Roy Cohn's mentoring of Trump on how to conduct business prepare Trump for a case like the Manhattan DA's? Because Cohn activated, um, I'm sorry, Cohn advocated that he always strives to leave absolutely no fingerprints. Now, in your reporting, how did this manifest in his daily life and behavior? Well, I'm glad you asked this, because when we talk about how Trump has always gotten away with things, it's not just dumb luck. He's actually very shrewd. And a couple of the lawyers I interviewed pointed this out. He doesn't leave fingerprints. And I do think that this was what he learned from Roy Cohen. You know, he he doesn't write things down. He doesn't take notes. Um, he doesn't use a computer much. I don't think he's got a personal email account, but you can tell me. if He doesn't know. even have a computer. OK, he doesn't even have a computer. Um, and so there's there's no he doesn't leave a record. And 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 emails really are the easiest thing for prosecutors to use as evidence these days. And And it's as if he sort of knows. And I imagine he probably does. Having been his lawyer, I got to ask, how conscious do you think he is of of making sure not to leave evidence? You know, I know he's you've said and others have said that he has a way of letting people know what he wants them to do without outright saying it so that there's no kind of record of him directing people to do something that might be against the law, but yet you know what he wants you to do. How much of that do you think is consciously on his mind so he doesn't get caught? Well, Trump, as I stated to you, never had a computer on his desk. What he, what we did is at one point in time, we bought him uh, an Apple, uh, a laptop, and we did that because he wanted to be able to watch golf while he was sitting at his desk. And so we had a, uh, you know, a laptop that he hooked into whether it's ESPN or one of the one of the channels. But other than that, he had no email address. He never texted. He used Keith or anybody else that was with him, Keith being his personal bodyguard, in order to all of his text messaging. Now, let me just let me let me just expand on your point about him not being direct. There are things that Donald Trump was very direct about. For example, when he would direct somebody to send a text message to whoever else it might be, he basically dictated it to you and you just wrote the text from your cell phone. Now, you know, that was pretty direct. But yes, he had the uncanny ability to direct others like myself to doing things only because I knew what he wanted. So if you went and you sat down with him for the first time, you would have no idea what he wanted. And so he would never even put you into that position. So that's one thing that you have to take your hat off, you know, to Donald Trump on. He was 100% aware of fingerprints that emails and text messages and documents 
were the downfall to many wealthy people before him. And he would always call them stupid for having emails. Mm -hmm. You don't need emails. Somebody else can handle it. So all his emails went to Rona. Or if it was somebody like a David Pecker, he would send me the email and I would then be required to bring it into Trump to see that's how he sets up the scenario. So it wasn't just me. Assuming you were working with, you know, the general counsel now, Alan Garten, you would send it to him and that person would tell you, make sure that you bring it into Trump to show it to him. But here's the thing. That person didn't even have to tell you to bring it into Trump because the mechanism and how the Trump organization ran is Donald was involved in every single aspect of every single thing. So people would stand online outside his door. He always liked the chaos, right? It was like a turnstile in front of his office where people would line up waiting for him to be free so you could walk in with your issue. And that's how he was able to successfully keep his fingerprints off of anything and everything by directing others, stupid people like me, to do it for him. It might make it hard, I would think, for the district attorney to bring a case against him, though, right? I mean, because um, there's not going to be emails and the kind of easy evidence. It's going to be people, what they call the lawyers, people like you lawyers call a paper case, right? That's going to be looking at all the records. Um, and they, they'd they like to have some witnesses, I guess. I would think that maybe you'd make a great witness. And I wonder if you're planning to testify. And I also wonder, what about Alan Weisselberg? Do you think he'll turn against Trump or not? No, that's, a, that's a great question. It's one that virtually every journalist has called me and asked me that same question. And here would be well, here's the answer that I give to all of them. First of all, if I am called as a witness, I would provide testimony. And as far as to the information that they have, they have millions of documents relating to Trump, his business, his kids, etc. And some of the things that we talk about a lot in the law is documentary evidence. The facts are the facts. And you don't need an email stating that I just killed Joe. There's a video of, uh, right, of the, of the assassination, of the murder. So you don't need a statement from that individual. There's evidence there that proves the truth of the matter asserted. And that's just what you have. And you have millions of these documents. So do I think that I may be called... Probably. Um, I mean, I certainly was there long enough. I was involved in enough of Trump's shenanigans in order to explain to a grand jury or to a jury, um, you know, what was going on there, uh, much of which will either be corroborated by others as well as with this documentary evidence. So I don't believe that you have to have, you know, the smoking gun email. Sure, it makes it easier, but I don't believe that's what the case will be predicated on. Now, as far as Allen is concerned, if Allen had half a brain, he has to understand that the district attorney, especially now that they brought in a seasoned, seasoned attorney by the name of Mark Pomerantz, they're not there to play games. Right. And knowing that Sai is leaving very soon, they're right now going through and scouring all of the documents in order to ensure that they have a fail proof case. That's how that's how I see it. Personally, I believe that they do. And I think that they should the indictment should have already started flying. But it's not my case to handle. You know, I let I let the experts <laughs> handle it on their own. Uh, as far as Weisselberg, I think Weisselberg's got trouble. I think his kids both Barry and Jack have issues. Barry certainly for things that we already know about that are going on. Jen was, talks about it um, a lot, uh, both in the press and uh, as well as on this podcast, you know, where she discussed bags of money. She talked about the apartment. She talked about um, how that they would compensate him and the fact that it's not uh, listed on tax returns. But I believe that the same sort of issue runs for Jack, who is the other son of Alan Weisselberg who's involved with Ladder Capital, and that's Ladder being the second and only other lender to Trump other than Deutsche Bank. So I believe that if Allen, who's about 73, 74 years of age, doesn't want to become the next Michael Cohen and 
be the fall guy for Donald so he could sit back at Mar-a-Lago and stuff his face with hamburgers and ice cream. I don't believe Allen wants to spend his golden years, you know, behind bars or to see his children behind bars. Squeaky doors, clogged sinks, finicky engines. When things break around the house, you take care of it. However, when something's off in the bedroom, you just try not to think about it. Come on, man. What are you waiting for? Take care of it. Go to GetRoman.com slash Cohen now. With Roman, you can get a free online evaluation and ongoing care for ED, all from the comfort and privacy of your home. A U.S. licensed healthcare professional will work with you to find the best treatment plan. If medication is appropriate, it ships to you free with two-day shipping. The whole process is straightforward and discreet. Getting started is simple. Just go to GetRoman.com slash Cohen and complete an online visit. Take care of your ED without ever leaving your home. Complete an online visit today to connect with a healthcare professional and just take care of it. So go to GetRoman.com slash Cohen now. You'll get $15 off your first month. It's really time to take care of your ED. And remember, get started today and you'll save $15 on your first order of ED treatment. Moving forward, because we're kind of winding down the hour, and I just have like two more questions for you. Your most recent article, which was published in the April 12th issue of The New Yorker, tells the story of a secretive poultry tycoon who financed former President Trump. Now, he's apparently part of some cabal of Trump supporting tycoons who either benefited from or exploited the pandemic for financial gain. What role do you think that Trump played in helping these guys make all of this money off of COVID? And what will happen as a result? Well, the guy you're talking about is is Ronald Cameron. And the company that he owns almost entirely by himself is the is a com- company called Mount Air Corporation. It's the, uh, I think, the sixth largest producer of chicken in this country and a very, very profitable company. Um, what happened was during the, the pandemic, the Trump administration decided that people who worked in places like meat packing plants and poultry plants were defined as essential workers. Those people had to keep going to work, even though COVID was spreading wildly in some of these plants. And and there were a, lo- a number of COVID cases in this man's in Mount Air in particular. But the, what was what was you know very helpful for Mount Air was that the Trump administration said that these people had to keep working regardless. And and so that was that was you know you could either say it's a clean policy decision or you could say maybe it's a favor for a very big donor. Ronnie Cameron was one of the biggest backers of Trump uh, in in the 2016 election and and he, and he gave very big again in 2020. So he's been in some trouble recently though. Um, his company just agreed in a a, a settlement to 200 million dollars in damages, I guess, for people whose land and water and air were polluted right around one of his chicken plants in in Delaware. It was a gigantic settlement. So um, I guess I thought of a terrible pun, but you could say the chickens are coming home to roost. Ah, that's a funny one. Sorry. (laughs) Anyway, it's it was, you know, that this was a these the big donors did really well under Trump. Face it. They they got a lot they got a lot of things that made their lives easier and the workers in that plant had a horrible situation going on. Well, we talked about it. Donald Trump to these billionaires were was nothing more than a useful idiot, and they knew it. They knew what Trump wanted, that Trump was for sale, which is what I understand. Most many of these pardons that he gave out were pardons for sale. I mean, it's truly amazing how dirty one individual could be and what makes it more fascinating is the fact that this dirty individual was the 45th president of the united states of america and still yet where is the investigation into the pardons where's the investigation into the witness tampering the obstruction of justice all of the low-hanging fruit i mean Could you imagine that right now, if you watch television, especially Fox, and they start talking about who today, if the election was coming around the corner, 
who would be the Republican nominee? Who would be the most favored individual to lead the Republican Party in 2024? And they say Donald Trump. And I'm blown away considering this idiot, right, bungled this pandemic so. He destroyed relationships with our allies while cozying up to our adversaries. I mean, the man is just an absolute buffoon. And you would think that the American people would have smartened up already after seeing that he accomplished absolutely nothing in four years. Yeah, he signed a whole bunch of executive orders. Great. You separated some kids from their parents. Mazel tov. Right. On top of that, you created the First Step Act. Right. Mazel tov. You did more for black, brown and federal inmates than Abraham Lincoln. Mazel tov. But you didn't. All you did is take your stupid Sharpie and that dumbass signature and you stuck it on a piece of paper and you tried to sell it to the American people as a success when in fact he has done absolutely nothing. And that's one of the reasons I filed my writ of petition for habeas corpus, because I believe that if the judge does what I'm asking for, my my petition will do more for the First Step Act in sticking it, you know, to the system so that people can go home to their family and back to society, especially, you know, these eligible federal inmates than anything Trump has done. I mean, he's got guys sitting that were in the running the Bureau of Prison, like the head of it, Michael Carvajal, who did absolutely nothing since he took the position from, I think her name was Kathleen Hawk Sawyer. Nothing has happened. They cannot even quantify how many hours equals how many days. So to me, I just ask people, what did he accomplish? Great. You know, he claims that they put up 20 miles worth of wall, right, between, you know, on our southern border. No, 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 you didn't, you freaking liar. You did not. What you did is you repaired walls, parts of walls that came down. So it's not new construction, it's repairs. And he doesn't talk that way. He doesn't talk about being a repair. We put up 20 miles, we put up 200 miles. No, they didn't do anything. They did nothing for immigration, right, other than try to tear it down. He did nothing for the Affordable Care Act simply because it had Obama's name attached to it. He had nothing as it related to the infrastructure fund, which, you know, the infrastructure bill, that, that's all we talked about for over a year. And instead of doing an infrastructure bill, he decides to do a Muslim ban. And why? Because he's a moron. There's no other way to describe it. The man is a moron. Could he have done any of this or succeeded this well without Fox News? No. And Fox News, OAN, and especially Newsmax. He could not have because legitimately the man is a moron. And the people that he had around him, they were all looking to advance themselves in various different, you know, in various different aspects. And instead of worrying about America and instead of worrying about the citizens and instead of they only cared about the reelection, they only cared about pleasing one person. You cannot be a representative of the state of Florida. Right. And uh, like a Marco Ruby or or you take like for Texas, you take um, Cruz or whoever else. Right. You cannot put aside the needs that your constituents have in order to placate one man. And rest assured, as I tried to explain it to the Republicans during my House Oversight Committee hearing, no matter what you do, you cannot satisfy this man for 365 days. The fact I lasted more than a decade is a freaking miracle because you cannot please him all the time. He's just one of those people that you could do 999 great things, but the only thing he'll remember is the one mistake. So take a guy like this, Matt Gates. He's screwed. Why? Because he made the cardinal sin. He got caught, and now he's not useful anymore to Donald. Therefore, bye-bye. Right. And that's just how it goes. But, you know, um, Jane, as we're winding down the hour, I have one last question for you. Last week in Florida, during the GOP retreat to Palm Beach, Trump, in his remarks to the gathered Republicans, referred to Mitch McConnell as a dumb son of a bitch. What do you believe happens to McConnell in the next election cycle as Trump continues to hammer on all of those who refuse to do his bidding on January 6th? 
Will we see more MAGA candidates run and primary more establishment candidates like McConnell back candidates or some of these others? Uh, I mean, the thing is, I mean, we're watching the Republican Party at, at war with itself, looking for, you know, some some soul. At, but you're but the, the fight is between two people who are relatively soulless, I have to say. Mitch McConnell, I spent months profiling him, trying to find anybody who felt he believed in anything bigger than just winning an election. And at a certain point at the end of the day, somebody who knew him really, really well said to me, give up, just give up, stop trying. He doesn't believe in anything. And and other than winning, that's him. Okay. And, and, and Trump in some ways is is not all that different. Uh, he believes in himself, but he just wants to be on top also. So you've got these two people who are both trying to be the major figure in the Republican Party, neither of whom are really wedded to kind of deep principle. And, you know, I mean, it, it's hard to to look at it with and, and just, you know, feel anything other than sort of um, how sad it is for what used to be called the grand old party. Yeah, and it's it's really rough on Biden in this administration because they have to undo and unpack four years of chaos, of destruction, of tearing down, you know, legitimate um, policies that have been going on for a long, long time. And now he has to overcome that. And interestingly enough, what happened to all of the individuals that are supposed to already be taking specific offices. They haven't even been confirmed yet. I think Merrick Garland was the last person to be confirmed. And what are we on, like day 74, 75 of the administration? I mean, this is ridiculous. You're supposed to come in with your, with your, it's a new company, it's a new president, right? It's time to come in with your people. You still have the same group of grifting fools that are just sitting in the same office, maybe they left, maybe they didn't, nobody knows. All I know is I'm waiting to see who's next for confirmation. I mean, that's how, that's what Biden needs right now. They need to start concentrating on putting their people into the proper office so that he can get things done. Well, they're actually, uh, you know, they are moving ahead on on some things. And it's almost as if the, the Republicans are, you know, being sidelined and treated as irrelevant. I mean, they've already they've they've passed the the first big bailout bill, which is is hugely ambitious, and they're moving on to the infrastructure. It it's you know, anyway, it's it I, I one of the people I talked to recently in Congress, a, a Democratic congressman said to me that the problem is that Trumpism is kind of spreading through Um, the House of Representatives on the Republican side. So you see more and more members coming in who want to be kind of like Trump. They don't really care about legislating. They just care about getting attention. Um, It's kind of like turning politics into a performing art. And, and, you know, and it's making it very hard for anyone to get anything done. Well, that's what Biden and Kamala now need to get a grip on this and figure out how to push it through the same way that Trump did, just do it by executive order. I don't care. Somewhere so that we can finally get some things back to normal. But, Jane, I want to thank you for joining me on Mea Culpa. And, um, you know, I'm sure I'll be speaking to you very soon. I hope so. Thanks so much. It's great to be with you, Michael. And now for today's Mea Culpa. This week, amidst the Derek Chauvin verdict, my own writ of habeas corpus petition that I filed to end my incarceration early was rejected by the judge hearing the case. The basic reason was patently ridiculous that the First Step Act, part of the 2018 prison reform bill that allowed people like me to reduce their sentences by taking classes and other measures inside prison, did not apply to me because the bill itself was just only being implemented two years after being introduced. It would have ended my incarceration in May instead of November. I am angry and believe that I have been handed a miscarriage of justice again and continue to be treated unfairly by the Justice Department and the Bureau of Prisons. But don't cry for me. What happened in Minneapolis and the verdict that found Derek Chauvin guilty is much more important. It speaks to the pain and trauma affecting an entire community who saw George Floyd in their own family members, their sons, their fathers, their uncles, and their brothers. 
but it also speaks to the problem of policing in general that must be fixed as scores continue to be killed on an almost daily basis. Part of it is institutional and will be rectified by legislation. But another facet is personal. We must collectively change our hearts. This country has taught itself to fear young black men. It has taught its police to shoot first and ask questions later. The anti-protest legislation recently passed in Florida and elsewhere aimed at curbing Black Lives Matter is part of this fear that marauding black men are coming to the white suburbs near you. But it's just patently false and part of a paradigm created by the disciples of Donald Trump, like the idiot Ron DeSantis, for us to fear and distrust one another. That this has continued must be rooted out at the source. But we only do that, though, by recognizing one another, not as black or white or Hispanic or Asian, but as human beings deserving of the same rights and respect that we afford to everyone. And that includes the right to expect you won't get killed by the police when you leave your home. Unfortunately, battle lines have already been drawn. The GOP wants all of us to continue to be afraid. But what is it that FDR said? The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. That's what's happening here. But we can stop it now if we all make an effort to say no more. Let's just say it together. No more. And thanks for listening. Mea Culpa is brought to you by Audio Up, Midas Touch, and LSJ Media. And it's written and produced by Jimmy Jelinek. Executive producers are Jared Gustat, Jimmy Jelinek, myself, Michael Cohen, and Phil Alberstadt. Our editor is Lisa Orkin. It may be a new day politically, but nowadays the landscape is more confusing than ever. Donald Trump may have lost the battle for the presidency, but in many ways, Trumpism is winning the war on the state and local level. Mea culpa is here to help guide you through the wilderness and keep you informed. And let's face it, we all want Trump, Rudy, and the rest of these seditious traitors to see justice. And folks, it's coming. So stay tuned as I guide you through the twists and turns of the criminal process that will ultimately see them behind bars. Mea culpa. Nothing but the truth. This is my